In this video, I'm going to discuss whether or not Zionists or anyone, for that matter, uh, can lay claim to the physical land of Israel or Jerusalem or any other land. And we're going to talk about this based on what the Bible says, not on what some rabbi says or some false teacher or false prophet or anybody else, someone who's manipulated scripture for a particular narrative. We're going to look at what God says, because that's the only thing that matters. I want to start in Acts 7 because Stephen kind of lays this out. There's a lot of history in the Old Testament. You can go through it. I'll even give you some of the citations. Isaiah 27, Isaiah 45, Isaiah 49, 56, Amos 9, Micah 4, Zephaniah 3. Then again in Matthew 1, there's this uh, lineage. And it, as the lineage is being described, it talks about the exile. Prior to the exile, when Babylon took over Israel and after the exile, when Babylon took over Israel. That's where so much is going to start and so much is going to hinge on understanding that exile. And so that's why when you go to Daniel 2, by the way, you know, Daniel 2 or Daniel 7, God starts with Babylon. So he doesn't go back to like when Assyria conquered Israel, but he starts with Babylon and he uses that language of Babylon. When he's talking about Babylon the Great, for example. And that's kind of interesting because he starts out these five kingdoms that took over, you know, that have ruled since Israel went into exile. Start with Babylon, Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia fell to Greece. Greece fell to pagan Rome. Pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. And you have papal Rome, the last kingdom on that statue that Nebuchadnezzar dream dreamt about in Daniel 2. That is the kingdom that the rock not carved out by not cut out by human hands is going to be thrown to and all of those kingdoms are going to come down. That's the kingdom of papal Rome and the prostitutes that bore out of her. The ten toes that you see in Daniel 2. That's Babylon the Great. So even though there's Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and papal Rome, papal Rome and the prostitutes that bore out of her, that's the kingdom that's going to come down and all kingdoms will fall when she comes down. That is Babylon the Great and the prostitutes that bore out of her as writ is written in Revelation 17. So let's start in Acts 7. Then the high priest asked, St asked Stephen, are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he had lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land. Even though at the time, at that time, Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brother who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came into power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. What a disgusting decree, right? Oh, it's just so sickening. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. 
Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. But they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals for the place you're standing, where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? Same thing they said to Jesus, right? Who made you? Like, who are you? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him out on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. By the way, I'm so sorry, but I left this out because it's quite actually the whole book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah talk about this exile. So I really encourage you to read those books as well. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought the sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. Okay, now, why did I read all of that to you? What does it have to do with the exile? Disobedience. It talks about what God did, what he established, the commands he gave his people, and disobedience. And what did God say about disobedience? He said, if you go off to serve other gods and you forsake me, I'm going to make you an object of ridicule and scorn among the nations. And now this same group of people is trying to say, well, not the same group of people, not all of them, a group of Jews who claim to be Jews, though they are not, okay, this is, these are not Jews. Maybe they're ethnic Jews, but they're not religious Jews. That group of people, Zionists, are trying to claim that they have right to that land. Well, let's hear what God did. This agrees what is writ with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Raphon, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. And that's prophesied in Amos 5, 25 through 27. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It has been made... As God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for God, the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or well, where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? Kind of silly, right? Like you're going to make, make me something out of what I've made? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are always, are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? Hello, guys. Remember that, okay? We just had someone fall who was too stupid to receive correction. And yes, I'm using the words of the word, Proverbs 12, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Don't be stupid. Don't think that some prophet is going to come along and like pull you aside and be like, hey, 
Do you think that what you're doing, you might correct what you're doing? If you're not listening to God, you won't listen to his prophets. If you do listen to God, then you will respect what his prophets have to say. If you don't listen to God, you are stupid. That's the bottom line. You are stupid if you don't listen to what he says. And then when his servants say something, you condemn them in order to justify yourself. You go and gossip and slander them and do all kinds of evil because you don't want to receive correction. So Stephen says... They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was given through the angels but have not obeyed it. So he's confronting the people about their rebellion. He's confronting them about their disobedience. He's telling them he is acknowledging that they are in exile. And what did they do? They didn't. They were stupid. They did not want to receive that correction. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Okay, so all throughout the Bible, we know that, you know, if you are a Christian, I, if you're a Jew, I don't know what to say to you. You should know the Old Testament. You should know that you're in exile. If you are a Christian, you know the New Testament. You don't have any excuse either. What does the New Testament prophesy? Isaiah 27, 13, and in that great day, a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. That happens at the end, guys. That happens when Jesus comes back. Isaiah 45, 13, I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. Has that been fulfilled? No, Cyrus represents Jesus. Jesus is going to rebuild his city and set his exiles free. His city is his people. Jerusalem is seen in Revelation as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband coming out of the sky. You know, in Acts 1, the apostles asked Jesus, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What does that mean? It means that they had no kingdom, that Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece had all come and pagan Rome, we know that. How do we know that? Pagan Rome was in power at that time. Pagan Rome was in power at that time because why? Because they were the ones who killed Jesus at the approval and provocation of the Jews. Certain Jews, not all Jews. Some Jews actually believed in Jesus. Those were the first Christians. Now in Revelation 17, we learn that there are eight kingdoms. So there's the first five that we learned about in Daniel. And then there's three additional kingdoms. And we also learn that the eighth kingdom is one of the seven and actually is the fifth kingdom. We know that. And that kingdom is the Antichrist. And that kingdom was once in power, then falls. And from the perspective of John in the vision in Revelation, he's in the he's at the time of the sixth kingdom. So we know that it's one of the five. And he's told that the kingdom was, now is not, while well, he's in the sixth kingdom, but will rise again. And that is the eighth kingdom. All you got to do is look into history. Who, who took down papal Rome? Napoleon, atheistic communism. Who took down communism? That would be Reagan with the help of the Pope. I believe it was Pope John Paul II. So the United States is the seventh kingdom, is the false prophet that testifies to that counterfeit Christian kingdom of papal Rome and the prostitutes that bore out of her through the Protestant Reformation. That's the Antichrist kingdom. They, they continue in the behaviors of their harlot mother. Christmas, Easter, doing away with God's calendar, his appointed times, his festivals, his new moons, all of that. His Sabbath, they even changed his Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week, Sunday, to worship their sun gods. They introduced the image of the cross through Constantine at that battle at Milvian Bridge with Maxentius. This is just basic history, guys. There was no, there was no cross image of the cross. Where is that in the Bible? There was no image in the Bible, period, unless they were wicked and God was destroying them. Now, what else does it say? Isaiah 49, 21. Then you will say in your heart, who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left all alone, but these, where have they come from? Okay, these things happen at the very end. And in Daniel 2, what you see is that Jesus, who is the rock that's cut out, 
not by human hands, but is thrown and is thrown to that fifth kingdom, the which will be the eighth kingdom in Revelation 17 is is the fifth kingdom and the eighth kingdom. When Jesus is thrown to that and Babylon falls, which by the way does not happen until after the resurrection, you can see that very clearly in Revelation, then the kingdom is established. And in Daniel 2 it says that he's going to establish a kingdom that will never ever be thrown down. It will be eternal. Then his people go in and possess the land. Okay, so a lot of narratives formed by rabbis and false teachers and false prophets being perpetuated by children of the devil like John Hagee and Jonathan Kahn. You need to wake up. You need to read your own word and stop listening to people put together a narrative. This is what the word says. When the apostles asked Jesus that question, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said, it's not for me to say the times or dates that the father has established by his own authority. And then the rest of the word tells us exactly when that's going to happen. And no Christians, Jews are not fulfilling your covenant for you. Hate to break it to you. Your covenant does not fall on Jews. Your covenant falls on you. Ezekiel 14, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. Ezekiel 14, 20, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save neither their son nor daughter. What makes you think they're going to save you? What makes you think that somebody else can bear your covenant for you and all you need to stand, do is stand by and blindly, without wisdom, without understanding, support the murder of anybody? I don't care whether they're right or wrong. The word says you are not to murder. How, are you, how can you stand by and support that? Thinking that you're so Christian. That's the most moronic thing I've ever heard. Read your word. Read the word God has given you. If you can't be bothered to read the word God has given you, there is no hope for you because you are what the Bible talks about, a person who does not love truth. You reject truth. So he rejects you as his priest. We have a Bible study every Tuesday. We study the Bible together. There's interaction. You can ask questions. We will answer those questions by the word, not by somebody's delusion. If you want to join us and you need help searching the word, then join us. But don't be stupid. Don't be without understanding and go support these things that you know intuitively you should know if God is in you that these things are wrong. What's going on right now in Israel is wrong. I don't care whether you agree with Islam or not. God didn't say go kill everybody who doesn't believe. He didn't tell you that. And I know those of you who support this, you like to accuse Islam of doing that, that they kill everybody who doesn't believe. But God also did not say go kill everybody who doesn't believe. He didn't say that to you. Whether or not that is true, which it's not. It is a misinterpretation of the Quran intended to malign Islam. But it doesn't matter. It still doesn't justify your murder. God did not set the bar in pagans. He didn't say, we'll just be a little better than the pagans and then you'll be saved. He said, become holy as he is holy, which means you don't get to justify yourself. Now go read the word.